All righty. Well, so we're going to pick up, uh, we're going to backtrack a couple of slides and I'll oh, probably be good if I uh, did this. See if that's going to put it up for you guys. There we go. Well, on that one, we should be good. Let's go presentation. So a lot of really getting this material is understanding all these little pressures. So we got lots of different pressures in the system that we define and we need to kind of get this in our head as to what these are. And then when we start applying this stuff, it's easy to get kind of lost in the pressures, okay? So we defined these before and I know what I was gonna do. I was gonna jump ahead. Like we got a figure up here. There we go. So this is our, our basic kind of simple diagram. This is, I don't know, four or five slides ahead. Um, but just to take a look at it, see what you got. You, we're showing a boiler, say sitting down here on the, the ground floor uh, of a building. And we've got return. <coughs> coming back from the system. So this is heating water that gets pumped out through HVAC units, terminal units, all that sort of thing. Boiler heats it, got gas and combustion, all that good stuff going on in here. Um, then we come out here, we've got a circulating pump, calling a booster pump, that pumps it up and circulates it through the system and brings it back, pretty simple. Uh, we'll talk more of this air troll fitting is one way to try to uh, separate air bubbles any air, because when you, when you heat water up, you're gonna liberate uh, nitrogen or any oxygen, any dissolved gases, and those, so they're rising up through here. So this fitting is designed to separate out those air bubbles and send them over to the compression tank. Okay, because we want to, we don't want this air, what, I mean, what could happen, if this air, these bubbles circulate through the pump and on out to the system, what could they do that would not, would be detrimental? For one thing, um, it would uh, it would cause um, those little vapor. Well, yeah, it could. But now there's a different cavitation is where the fluid that you're pumping gets to or below the vapor pressure the tem at at its temperature, and it actually boils. Mm -hmm. So this is a little bit different. I mean, but they are you know, they are gas bubbles in there, so they could contribute, they could hurt the pump a little bit if there was a lot of them. That's, that's one possibility, okay? Out in the system, what could happen? Why do you not want air circulating? Why do we have to control air in all of this? Well, where could it accumulate? High points may well be a coil. And so if you're constantly circulating air with the water into the heating coil, the air is going to come out, it's going to rise up to the top, and it's going to start filling that coil with air. And after a while, you know, you can't get any water in because it's air bound. And then, of course, they, he taught, we talked before about, well, you can put automatic air vents, but the automatic air vent can become a leak and then you start leaking water out of the system, and then you got to put more water in the system, and then you're putting oxygen and, and, and crud in the system that comes in with the makeup water, and so that's not good. So, you know, I guess the best thing would be to have a manual vent, but then you would have to develop a problem before you would know to go, you know, open the manual vent to drain the air out. So air control, and especially, you know, I mean, if it's a small building, then it's probably not a big deal. But you know, what if you have hundreds of these units around? This could be get to be a major problem after a while. So anyway, that's some of the motivation to control this. And that's just one of the fittings and things that we do. So then this is going out to the system, okay? So we're showing, uh, this is a system, we're showing an initial uh, cold fill pressure of four PSIG at the top of the system. Okay, and that, you know, we had that table before based on the water temperature and all and where the pump is and all that sort of thing, what we wanted for the initial cold fill. And so four is like the minimum. So this is kind of just the standard manila kind of system. 
So we got four up there. And then this is where the compression tank hooks in. And this is where the cold water and the pressure uh, uh, reducing valve uh, is located that controls water flow into the system. So it's all about the same level. Okay, and so we see where we're, we're showing from this level up to here, 18 and a half feet. Okay, so 18 and a half feet will, in terms of static head, will generate how much pressure? How much pressure will we have at this point based on 18 and a half feet of water standing on top of it? Well, what's our magic number? It's 2.3 or 2.31. These slides tend to use 2.3. I think 2.31 is really the official number. But so if you take 18.5 divided by uh, 2.3, well, you get eight, okay? So we got eight from static head and we got four up here that we wanted to have keep pressure at the top of the system plus four, gosh, that's 12. And look what they're saying. That, so that basically we've got 12 pounds right here. Here's the initial, now this is cold, okay? Because then we're gonna heat it up and guess what, that water's gonna expand and we're gonna get an increase in pressure, okay? So initial cold pressure at tank and pressure relief valve and see the relief valve. So the relief valve is right here. It's protecting the boiler because it's the thing that is most likely to go boom and that's a bad thing, <laughs> you know. Years, you know why ASME was founded? Digressions are always good. I teach by digression. Why was ASME founded back in like 1890 or something? To work to prevent boiler explosions. They were one of the leading causes of death in the U.S. in like cities. There's a daggum boilers exploded. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a really bad day when you went in and the boiler in your building exploded. I mean, if you were close, you were gone, you know, because these are big time explosions. You know, well, I'll do that. I might do that and find some videos, some YouTube videos on boiler explosions just to give you a, a feel for this. But anyway, that's why I think that's why the main reason ASME was founded was to put together engineers to work to eliminate the problem of boiler explosions. And how many boiler explosions do you hear of today? Not many. So, hey, we've been successful. And now ASME does all kinds of other things. You know, we've branched out in lots of different areas. But anyway, so whatever the component is that has the lowest pressure rating, the one that you have to protect first, that's where the relief valve goes. You know? And so this relief valve would be set to whatever the max working pressure is on this boiler. If it's 30, 30 gets used in here. I've got, one, I've got a, a screen capture of some specs on a lock and bar boiler that's like 160, you know? So it depends on what boiler you buy, okay? So probably higher pressure ratings are gonna cost a little bit more. So that's part of your design is to select all that as a design engineer. So anyway, this thing we're saying right here, this stuff is all tied in together and you know, in HVAC, we round things, you know, we don't, it's not like the space shuttle where you need three digits of accuracy, you know, you get within, you know, plus or minus, you know, 5%, eh, you're probably going to be okay. You know, so it's a little more forgiving because all of these things, capacities and all that are dependent on so many different things, you know, if the, if the water temperature changes, if the water pressure changes, you know, if the humidity changes on the air across the, I mean, all this stuff affects capacity. So, and so there's some variability in it. So, you know, we, we typically select for like a worst case scenario or close to a worst case scenario, and then maybe make it just a little bit bigger. And tends, things tend to be oversized out there in the HVAC world. Okay. So, this is how we're, we're, so we're saying basically we got 12 PSI here when it's cold and eight of it is because of this elevation and four of it is because of this. Okay. All right. And we'll come back and forth to this, but 
a lot of things refer back to that and until you've seen the diagram sometimes. So now maybe we get a little bit better feeling for what some of these pressures mean. Uh, initial cold field pressure. So that's by definition pressure applied at the filling point. So, hey, where are you, you know, you got a pump, you bring it in on a skid or something, you know, to fill it. May not be the circulating pump, probably not. And, you know, you plug it in or it could be on a combustion engine. It could be a, a, an engine driven pump, you know, that we just carry around the jobs to fill them, you know. And so we got to have a place where we hook it in, you know, provide water supply to it from the city and, you know, pump up the system. So this is the point. Uh, pressure applied at the filling point needed to fill the system to its highest point plus a minimum pressure at the top of the system. So, you know, if you connected here, it would be different than if you connected down here because you would have to pump that water all the way to the top. If you come in up here, you can put water in and basically because of your elevation, it's going to fall down to the bottom levels of the system and fill it. And of course, you got to vent air out of all of this while you're doing it. Okay, static pressure. I think we've been working with that. Pressure caused by height of water above any point. One PSI of static pressure equals 2.3 feet of water. Now, let's do this. Let's come out of this for a minute. And all engineers should have some sort of an electronic version of steam tables. Once you graduate from college, or for homework, this is fair game. You know, we love to make you go and do double interpolations in the steam table to make sure you understand how to use the steam table. But once you go out into the workforce, your boss will fire you for doing manual double interpolations because you're gonna take 15 minutes for something that you could punch into a calculator and get an instant answer for. And he just wants you to get the right answer. He doesn't really care about you being able to do double interpolations in the steam table. Okay, so that's a persecution of thermodynamics, you know, that, that, that goes away. A lot of good, you know, as you get old, there are a few good things about getting older in life. One of them is some of this aggravation that we do to you in school goes away. You know, we just want to make sure that you understand what this is. So let's, th this is one, and there's a bunch of them. I've got something on my phone. I don't use it very much, but on the computer, uh, Chemical Logic Steam Tab Companion, free download. And there, but there's a lot of them out there, you know, everything is available on apps these days. But, you know, let's look, let's just play a second. Let's put in 60 degree water. Calculate. Okay, density, 62.36, roughly. If you, can you read that? Maybe not, it's an eye test. But anyway, right here it says density, 62.36, 62.36, and that's what? Pounds mass per cubic foot, I think. Okay, so for our visitors, we can, you know, I could be nice and I could choose metric, but I don't know what 60, to, what's, what's 60 degrees in C? 16? Okay, so we, so you know, if it's 16, then see, I mean, it, this will do. It's also, what, 998 kilograms per meter cubed, you know, whatever. So, but you need to know that, you need to know the density of standard water in whatever system of units you need. That needs to be embrazened in your mind, you know, some of this stuff you need to know. But, man, I just, I'm sorry, guys. I just can't hardly do that. So anyway, now um, let's say that we're dealing with uh, 180, 180 degree heating water. 180, calculate. Oh, the density is 60.58. So this is at 60. Sixty point fifty-eight. Is that what I said? We're the same units. 
Okay. If I divide that, what does that equal? Don't, not the number. What do we call that quantity? You, you know, it's funny. This is, this is a very important parameter in pumping and fluid and all that sort of thing. It's like, I think you hit this in physics, and then I don't know that we do much with it. it over here. Specific gravity. You know, it's specific gravity. It's the, it's the, it's basically the ratio of the density of your fluid to a standard, and the standard we use is typically standard water. Okay, so that particular number is in this case sixty point fifty eight divided by sixty two point thirty six is point nine seven. Nine seven. Okay, so let's go back to our column of water. Let's say we have a hundred foot. We have our little pressure gauge down here, and this is vented. What's this pressure gauge? If this is standard water, what's this read? This reads what times two point three one equals two hundred and thirty. Is that right? Feet nah, I divide, right? Which way do I do this? It's 100 feet. And the standard is like 2.31 feet to one PSI, right? I can't do that. So that's 43.29. What if I have that same tank over here, vented, gauge, whatever, and this is my same 100 feet, and this is 180 degree F water. Do I have more or less pressure? Huh? It doesn't weigh as much, right? It's lighter, so it has to be less. So I can either do a calculation or I can take this times 0.97 because I already have the ratio. And so times 0.97. So this one will be 41.99 PSIG. Okay. So you're just, you're just changing the weight. So, you know, the practical ramification to have the same pressure on the gauge, the column of water has to be taller because it doesn't weigh as much. Okay. So you can work it two ways. You can say, okay, I'm going to maintain the same pressure. How tall does the column of water have to be? Or I can keep the column of water the same. And how does the pressure change? So, you know, it, but it's, that's important that you realize that. Okay. And specific gravity is an input. You get out doing any engineering work, looking at pumps and all that stuff. Specific gravity comes up all of the time. And in general, I find that when students just come up through the junior ranks, they, you've heard this at some point, but they don't really use it very much. I think, did y'all hear this in physics or chemistry or someplace? I, I mean, I, I know you did, but I mean, it's not reinforced very well. And so you need to know what specific gravity is. And that's why we just did that. Okay. Okay, so operating pressure increase 
the pressure increase created by water expansion upon compressing uh, air within the compression tank. So on that system, once we fire that boiler, we fill it with cold water, you know, 40, 50, 60, whatever it is, and then we fire the boiler and it goes up to 180 or 200, that water's gonna grow. And so that's what the compression tank there, there's air in that. And so that air compresses, but as it does, it drives up the pressure in the tank and it drives up the pressure at the relief valve. Okay, let's go. I should have put this closer. Okay, and so when I heat this up, then these pressures are going up and it depends on what? What, what the temperature range is and how much water's in the system and how much volume's in the tank as to how much, you know, if I, if I have a little bitty compression tank, I mean, I could, I could completely fill it and then have a, a huge increase in pressure. If, if I have a huge compression tank, then oh, it'll just barely go up. So that's what we're getting to on how to size compression tanks for this. But as this, so as we heat this up, this pressure goes up some, hopefully we did it right and it doesn't go up too much. But so then um, we have that pressure here at the relief valve, okay? So that pressure is gonna go up. So that what, that what that goes up to with the pump in operation, we'll get there in a second, is the allowable increase. So, you know, when this is cold, maybe everything's sitting here at 12, but let's say the setting on this is 30, then my increase is 18. And that's taken at the relief valve because that's, that's the sucker that's gonna pop, you know? So we have to look at that. Oops, one too many. Okay, so operating pressure increase is defined as pressure increase created by water expansion, compressing air within the compression tank. You know, we're just doing definitions, but you know, you, if you don't understand the terms, you don't have a chance. You, you're gonna be lost, uh, you know, immediately. And then the pump pressure is the pressure difference created by the operation of the pump. So I do all that and the pump's off, and then I turn the pump on, what does that affect the pressure at the relief valve? We would like to design our system so that it doesn't. But if I put, if I put that relief valve and that piping where it, and that boiler on the discharge side of the pump, when I turn that thing on, bingo, pressure jumps, then I, I, if, if I do it wrong, I'll cause the, every, time, every time we circulate the boiler, we drain water out of the relief valve. Hmm. I don't think you're going to get called back to design another system for that client because they say this that's not right here. You know, it's not supposed to do that. Okay, so we got to think about all that stuff. You know, the devil's in the details. You know, the concepts are very simple. You know, oh, I got a cold building, gonna have boiler, gonna circulate some hot water, do this. Okay, throw some pipes in there, we're good to go. And I work that way. Okay, uh, let's see. So yeah, we hit this before. So you know, when you're doing a closed system, we, we just have to establish minimum and maximum pressure levels. Um, okay, definition, minimum pressure is, that's what happens at the top of the system when it's cold with the pump off. So that's that fill pressure. Maximum pressure is determined by pressure limits of the components. So when they select this maximum pressure, you know, you got to look at the components that are going in, you know, often it's the boiler, but it could be something else, you know, and, and whatever has the lowest pressure rating is what has to be protected. Okay, so maximum pressure determined by pressure limits, component selected by the engineer occurs when system's hot, design condition, we're cooking, and all the pumps are in operation. So that's going to be our max. Okay, and then we got, we've already seen this table A, so um, I think we're pretty good on that. Uh, we had this, you know, pressure equivalent at the top of the system to the boiling point of water, 15 degrees above the design temperature of the system. So we had that before. There's the table. I don't think we're gonna do that again. 
Does anybody have any questions? I think we can motor through that. Um, yeah, and this is talking about, so, you know, our kind of general Manila system without a lot of elevation, you know, four PSI is pretty common. Uh, high temperature systems, especially when the pump comes up in the building, higher levels, we have to increase that pressure to protect the pump. Uh, this is what the old guys in the field say, you know, as you heat this up, you're going to increase pressure in the, the, in the system because the water is going to expand into the compression tank. Some guys would say, well, that increase is adequate to protect the pump. That's not recommended. It's recommended that we do this 15 degrees above the uh, highest maximum temperature. And just a warning about, you know, we got to not cavitate the pump. Uh, okay, low temperature water, you need to know this spec is maximum 150. Um, uh, 15 degrees, say we've been through that. Um, yeah, so we're still doing the protect. So, you know, if it's 250 water, we add the 15 to it, 265, we go to the steam tables and we see what the saturation pressure is at 265. I have an example of this in just a second. So I think we've been through that. Yeah, you can read over that, but we've said all that stuff multiple times. So there's my steam tab companion. So what I did, so th this would be for design maximum water temperature of 250. I add 15 to it, I get 265. I click liquid, I click English units, and I click calculate, and it comes back 38.55, and this is, absolute and remember we're you know so you got to be clear between absolute and gauge i take off 14.7 or 15 whatever for gauge and i get pretty close to 24 and that's where that 25 comes from it's just rounded up to 25. so that's an example of actually doing that calculation okay okay and you know you can find charts and all of this good stuff. Uh, let's see, pump pressurization versus design temperature. Uh, here's, here's your saturation, boiling pressure as a function of temperature, and here's the recommended uh, minimum pump pressurization, okay? So you can see at 250, you know, we're all the way over here where minimum, it's, it comes out 24, 25, you know, whatever. The calculation says 24, but when they write the slides, they just, oh, what the hell, let's say 25, you know, it's a good number. Now, just, just, to, just to play again, so let's look at, let's check this pressure. Let's make sure we know what's going on. 220, we're showing two PSI as the saturation or the boiling pressure. Let's go, let's, let's go back to the steam tab companion and put in 220. Uh, we're liquid, English, 220. And calculate. Hmm. And I get seven pressure. I get 17.2. This says two. What the heck's going on? This is gauge. So, and in the, on these things, people are too lazy to do 14.7, so they just take 15 off. So 17.2 minus 15 is 2.2, and they just say, ah, forget, forget about the point two. So they put two on here. Say, I got news, I wouldn't have been a good rocket engineer. This is my kind of engineering. You know, I can do this, do it quick. Go, ah, yeah, go out in the building, look at it. You know, I, I don't know. Okay, so I did that because I wanted to be sure. I was looking at these pressures and I go, now are those gauge or are those absolute? And you know, it's always, it's, it's usually better to do a test, whatever kind of test you like, where you know you can figure out what, exactly what you're dealing with. So you don't make some stupid mistake. I don't know, I use this example all the time. Some of you probably heard it, the Hubble telescope. When they put it up, it was blind. 
It was blind. It couldn't see. It was it two hundred fifty million, three hundred million dollars? You know, chump change for the go government. But they put it out. It couldn't see anything. Well, crap. That was a bad day for NASA. What's wrong with this daggum thing? You know what was wrong with it? A unit conversion error. Yeah, they cut the mirrors. They got these big mirrors that focus all the incoming light, you know, so they can get, see all this great stuff. When they cut the mirror, they cut them wrong because of a unit conversion error. And so later they sent a space shuttle flight up with a new set of mirrors. And so they, 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 cut, <laughs> they called the service guys from NASA. Oh yeah, we can fix that. So they ordered up the, the new mirrors. They loaded on our truck. They took it out, put it on a space shuttle. Took four or five guys at another probably $50 million and fired them up into space and they made a service call. And you know who got to pay for it? Well, not you guys. The rest of us got to pay for it. God bless the government, you know. But I mean, you know, so don't think that units and conversions don't matter. That's where the worst mistakes, you know. All, the, the civil engineers on structural stuff, when stuff falls in, you know, balconies break. There was that walkway at the Regents, Hot Regency in Kansas City. Was, this suspended walkway had a bunch of people on it and it fell down and a bunch of people fell to their death, like seven stories. What was wrong? Calculation there. I mean, you know, oh man, you know? So you, you just can't, you, you know, it, it's the little stuff. You know, you get all this education, you go, yeah, man, I know how to do that. And daggum, you do all this work, pages and pages of work, and it turns out to be wrong because one stupid little conversion factor was off by a factor of 100, and nobody caught it. Yeah, it's awful. So, I mean, you just can't be too careful on units. Anyway, so this just kind of shows, you know, here's the temperature, here's the boiling point, here's what we want as protection for the system. All uh, right, minimum pressurization. Uh, so it's talking about the, it's the relief valve location um, that protects things. We've talked about that. So he says here, I don't know if I agree with this personally, but um, this Bell and Gossett document says, good system design operation will show the system pressure reaching but not exceeding the pressure relief valve setting only when the system reaches its maximum. So, they, so they're saying you should take it right up to that relief valve setting. I think if I was doing it, I'd, I'd be, I would expect it to be a little bit below because I would be afraid that something wasn't right. Maybe there was more water in the system than I knew of and that I would be popping that relief valve. But anyway, that's what, that's what Bell and Gossett thinks. Uh, just our picture again. So we jumped ahead and looked at that. Think, I think we're pretty well through that. Okay, okay, now we get on to some other stuff. Okay, so read the question down there. How can the pressure in the tank and thus at the tank connection, so in the tank and so all of this is the same pressure and it's gonna cause that pressure to be the same right there, okay? How can that pressure change? And it says only if water is added or removed from the tank. Well, how can we add more water or less water from the tank? There are two ways to add, remove water from the tank, and they are listed here, okay? If we heat this thing up, the water expands, it will force more water into the tank by temperature change is one way. The other way is to add or remove water from the system, okay? That's it. Now you need to, okay, some of this stuff is not intuitive. This was not intuitive to me, this point we're driving for here. But so I had to, I mean, I've been through this now a bunch of times and so I now accept it, but it's not intuitive for me. So but what that, what that implies is when I turn this pump on, this pressure does not change. If I do not change the amount of water in the system or I do not change the temperature of the water. So if you put a pressure gauge right there at the point that the, the compression tank hooks into the system, you can, you can run the pump or not and that gauge won't change. Is that intuitive to you? I don't think so. But that's one of the fundamental principles in designing a piping system. The point 
of connection of the compression tank to the piping system is called the point of no pressure change. Run the pump, don't run the pump, I don't care. That pressure is not going to change unless I do one of those two things. And so once I get the system up to temperature and I don't leak any water, that pressure is not going to change very much. Now, so if this pressure doesn't change, if I turn the pump on, does the pressure change here on the discharge? Daggum right. Okay, so no pressure change. Start the pump. Well, the pump puts energy into the thing, so then the pressure jumps up here. And guess what? It, then it bleeds off by friction on a closed loop. It bleeds off all the way back and I get 12 PSI right here again, okay? If I turn it off, I still get 12 PSI here. It's just, I just get changes, you know, pressure changes with elevation perhaps as I go through this thing with the pump off, but that's all I have. Interesting, isn't it? Now, this is what's common. I'll just give you a, a preview of this. So what if I screw up? And I make this connection down here. Has anybody ever done that in the world? Oh, yeah. So what happened? So let's say the pump causes a 20 PSI change in pressure. When I set this up, this is 12 here, say 20, say this is 32 right here. If I put this in over here, and this becomes the point of no pressure change, and I turn that pump on, what happens here? It's 12 minus 20. 12 minus 20, and that's on the suction of the pump. It boils. I pull the pressure down so low that the fluid boils and I cavitate the pump. So then what happens is this pressure goes down 20 and then it jumps up 20 and then you know it it bleeds off as I because I have you know pressure loss as I go back around the system and it drops until I get back down to my what is 12 minus 20 uh, minus 8 minus 8 psi that's pretty hard vacuum what's the sat I wonder what the what's the what's the boiling temperature oh this is fun I don't usually do this okay so so minus 8 and 15 is seven. So we say atmospheric pressure is 15 and we're minus eight. That gives us what? Seven PSI A. Okay. So we can put, we can go pressure and we can go seven and we can calculate. Oh crap. That's no fun. <laughs> Higher than I thought. It's still 176. So, you know, maybe, maybe you actually would not cavitate. Dead gummit. I thought for sure you'd cavitate. But anyway, that would be your saturation temperature under that scenario coming into that pump. Questions? It's funny how this stuff it started, it seems so simple, but then that gum engineering gets in the way, you know, and all of this stuff jumps up. you walk out of class and like an hour later you go, what was all that stuff? <laughs> it's all that saturation stuff he was talking about. That old man's crazy. <laughs> anyway, questions on this? We will come back to this discussion again. It's, but I just, I like to kind of give you a primer and then we come to the actual slides and you kind of get it again. And after you go through it a couple of times, it sinks in better. All right. Now we go. We still have time. Uh, okay, here's the specs on the ASME low pressure uh, boiler code. 250 is the max temperature, and it can be up to 160. That's why this boiler that's coming up is has a maximum working pressure of 160. I hadn't noticed that before. But so that's the max pressure. That's the max temperature for uh, low pressure operation. Okay. And you can go up to 160 so long as you don't put a component that's rated at 
70 because <laughs> guess what? It's going to fail at that higher pressure. Uh, usually, hot water heating boiler sets the maximum working. So they're saying, you know, the pipe and the fittings and all that usually has a much higher rating than the boiler. Uh, if selected for 30 working pressure, then the 30 PSI relief valve should be installed at the same level as the boiler. You know, we kind of went through that on the diagram. Uh, initial cold pressure at the relief valve will be equal to the static head above the valve plus any additional cold fill pressure. So that's the initial cold pressure at the relief valve. Okay. There's, there's the specs from Lockenvar. This is part of them. So uh, let's just look. So these are kind of nice little baby boilers. You know, they're not, they're not real big. Um, but why it's not 500,000, I don't know. So this is BTUs per hour. This is input. I'm pretty sure that's input energy in the natural gas. We can play around with that for the for the smallest one and see see their their nomenclature. Once you know a little bit about how they they name things, you can you can tell the boiler input capacity just by looking at the model number, right? CB. Uh, I'm not sure which C. That's their model. This is this particular model of boiler, I think. And then 0495. We'll see that's 495,000 BTUs an hour input. So see they're showing you the input energy in the model number. So if you just walk up to a boiler and you look at that, you, know, you see that model number, you automatically know what the input is for it. Up to uh, 2 million 65,000 BTUs an hour. So that's a CB2066. So they just rounded it, okay? Now, let's see, let's play. We, we had an equation for uh, heat input to water, and what is it? It was 500 GPM delta T. Remember that was our little, but that was really for standard water because that 500 is just standard density. It's what? It's 8.34 pounds mass per gallon. And then there's a 60 in there to convert from gallons per minute to gallons per hour, and then you just convert. So that's really, and CP is one, so that's really M dot CP delta T, okay? And now, so you could use that, and if you're gonna do higher temperature water, you could just hit it with a specific gravity, and that would account for the reduced mass flow because of the decreased density of the water. Or you can go to the steam tab companion and you can get the density and you can do all of that stuff and calculate it. But I'm trying to show you some kind of quick, and you can remember a few easy equations and if you know how to juggle them, man, you can turn out numbers in a hurry. And of course, you know, oftentimes you sit in meetings, you're in the office with your boss or whatever, and somebody, somebody needs a quick number and you know, if you always say, well, I'm sorry, I gotta go get my thermal book, I gotta go sit down and do this, you know, it's not the best. It doesn't put you, cast you in the best light. So if you have a few of these things, you just pull out your phone and you go, ah, just a second. Ah, that temperature increase would be X, Y, Z, you know? And, and you can be pretty darn close. So I'll put this up here again. So, so Q dot is equal to 500, GPM delta T. Of course, this is Fahrenheit and gallons per minute. And the 500 is comes from 8.34 uh, pounds mass per gallon time and times 60 minutes. Yeah, if I could write, it'd be nice. 60 minutes per hour, okay? And so if you do that arithmetic, I think it comes out real close to 500. Okay, and then you could put SG 
over here. Where if you got standard water, this is 1.0. And if you've got higher temperature water, you come over here and you estimate a specific gravity and throw it in there. You know, if you're sitting in a meeting, you could go, eh, 0 0.95, 0.97, you know, whatever. And get pretty darn close. Okay. So I don't know, let's play, what do we got? So gallons capacity, when we fill this thing up, it's operating, how much water is in it? Okay, we can see this, this big guy's got 4.8 gallons. Well, that's still not a whole lot of water. So, you know, this is not a great big boiler. Uh, heating surface, square feet. How much heating surface area do we have? Up to 200, 59 here on the low one. Water connections, engineers need to know that for the plumbing design. We gotta put that on the plans. Uh, drain, got a three quarter inch drain. Max water flow rate and GPM. So the max you can put is 90, 55 here up to 90. Well, okay. So let's look at that big guy. If I put 90, if I had 90 GPM in this thing, and let's say I've got some fairly high temperature water, I can use a specific gravity of 0.97, and I've got 2,065,000 BTUs an hour, what's my maximum temperature rise that I can get my delta T across that boiler? Well, okay, so that's two, zero, six, five, one, two, three. And what specific gravity is gonna be a divide, divide by 0.97, divide by 500, divide by what, 90, right? GPM, yeah. So 47.3 is my maximum delta T. Well, say I want to set my, you know, well, this is say I'm gonna come out, maybe my maximum temperature is 80. So what then, 180. So then what's my minimum cold water temperature in to be able to get to 180, so minus plus, 180 equals, I have to go in at 132.7 or higher. If I'm higher, it'll just, you know, cut back on the firing rate a little bit, you know, modulate firing rate. But if I go in at 120, I don't have enough boiler. So see, that's another part of your design on your system is to figure out what your heat loss is, make sure that water temperature coming back. If you're losing water, you have to make up water, that's cold water, and that's gonna affect your make up water temperature to your boiler. So you gotta figure that into your design. Okay, I don't know, what else we got on here? Uh, head loss, what's the pressure drop, your size in the pump? What's the pressure drop across the boiler? To make sure your circulating pump is, it has to push through that. So you've got all of your other losses, but to push through the boiler, over here, what is this? Is that, is that the four and a half number? Yeah, and that's feet of head, okay? Uh, maximum working pressure, that's why we started this with 160, and that matches up with the maximum for the low temperature water ASME code. Uh, relief valve size, one inch. Relief valve rating. A number of relief valves. So it's interesting. Instead of putting a bigger one, they put two. I don't know. We got Robert Wiseman is a tech guy and he's head of product development now for Lock and Bar. He's on our external advisory board. Wiseman's a really good guy. We see him every once in a while. And uh, I have to ask him what's their logic? Maybe it's cheaper. Maybe they, I don't know, maybe they think it's better. I'm not sure. I don't know the answer to that. It's interesting. When you really look, dig into these specs, you see things all the time and you go, well, I wonder why they do that. You know, I'm not sure on that one. Okay. So as we've talked a little bit, pump operation may also affect pressures at the relief valve. So let's say my cold fill pressure is 12 and I can go to 30, that's 18 but as soon as I turn the pump on from 12, I go to 20, all of a sudden then I only got 10 
that's going to be handled by the to handle the the volume expansion on temperature increase. So all this has to work together. Um, okay, big definition here. So and we I think we've said this, but the difference between the initial pressure at the relief valve and the relief valve setting determines the allowable increase. System pressure increase is used to determine the compression tank sizing. Larger the increase, the smaller the tank can be, the less costly it can be. Uh, now with a high rise building, what if I've got a, you know, say I've got a 10 story building, this is 12 foot per story, 120, could be 130 feet, something like that. Okay, well, this component that I'm gonna protect, is it gonna be in the basement? Or is it gonna be up on the top? Because if it's in the basement, that relief valve has got that 130 feet of water, thereabouts, setting on top of it, that's gonna increase the pressure at the relief valve, you know, before we start heating the system, so then the allowable increase goes down, compression tank goes big. If I can locate that, that boiler at the top of the building, then I don't need as large a compression tank. So all that uh, has to, to, to be figured out. Um, a lot of large buildings use shell and tube heat exchangers. What, what are the two prevalent kinds of heat exchangers? That would be a good little, that'd be a good video to dig up or something. Okay, and so between the two, plate and frame are probably cheaper, but they cannot stand as high a pressure rating. So HVAC probably will use plate and frame heat exchangers. Like if you had a water cooling, a water economizer, remember what a water economizer is? That's where we're gonna run our cooling tower when it's cold outside and generate cold water, and we're gonna cool down our chill water, instead of running the chiller, we're gonna run just the cooling tower. So we would have a plate and frame heat exchanger where the cooling tower water goes on one side and the chill water goes on the other side because we don't wanna send that cooling tower water with all the oxygen in it out into the system. So we limit its circulation. We put a shell and tube because they're, for capacity wise, they're cheaper, but they can't handle a lot of pressure. So if you're in a situation where you've got a big high rise building, all this equipment's in the basement, then you're gonna need a heat exchanger that can handle higher pressures. That's gonna lead you to the shell and tube variety. Okay, because it can handle the high static head. Mm. Um, you know, so we, I already think I mentioned, you know, elevating the boiler, is one means of reducing that static pressure. So I think we're through that. Okay, so here's uh, a graph that gives you know fundamental information. So this figure three shows how varying the initial fill pressure affects the airspace trapped in a tank on initial fill. So you know you're gonna wherever you hook it in, you're gonna carry that tank in there and it's just gonna be full of air, okay? They don't, on this type of tank, they don't try to evacuate it, okay? And then they fill the system. So a, a kind of standard number that gets used a lot for this is 12 PSI. Standard setting 12 PSI for a pressure reducing valve. So at, if you come over here, this dotted line is uh, 12, so you come over to the curve and down. So what's that read down? That's about 55%, uh, okay? And um, so this is the percent of tank volume as air trapped on initial fill. So we've lost, let me see, am I reading that right? Yeah, 55. So what I've lost 45% of my tank volume just when I filled it, okay? If I have to go up 